welcome to the uh, pragmatic uh, devops session by by vedik uh, so for those who don't know vedik he is a I, I, i would say he is a in agile india written this is his third year uh, he is an experienced in engineering leader with a focus on building products infrastructure and high performance organizations he has deep interest in devops sre cloud native technology software architectures and technology uh, leadership as a craft uh currently he is working as a freelance technology consultant helping startups in india to rethink their approach uh, on the software delivery operations architecture devops and technology leadership uh prior to this he has worked in uh, blinkit which was formerly known as uh, brofor as their vp engineering for devops and security without further ado i would not now like to invite vedik uh, to talk us through pragmatic uh, devops Uh, thanks for that intro richard thank everyone um i hope you're enjoying the conference so far um i know it's a weekend morning so thanks a lot for making it to the uh, to the session and i i hope to make it worth your while um thank like you said my name is vedik kapoor i am an independent technology consultant before this i spent 6 years leading engineering at blinkit or formerly groofers we sell grocery online um when groofers started our technology practices were far from ideal um a lot of things went wrong in how we set up our technology teams and thankfully we managed to course correct in the following years uh today i want to talk about why and how we kept going in the wrong direction how did we course correct and uh what lessons of pragmatism we learned out of that journey um and finally we will discuss uh, the much disputed topic of maturity models and how we use them at linkedin and hopefully along the way we will engage in an interesting conversation during and after the talk um but now i usually start my talks with a story because uh, stories help us understand the context of an environment um and my talk today is all about context so i'm going to tell you a little story first and the core of our talk will follow uh, a little later so please uh, bear with me So Grofer started in 2013 as a hyper local grocery marketplace delivering uh, orders in 90 minutes. You could go on our app, find the nearest grocery store, place an order and we'll deliver it to you. Um we started with a simple architecture, three services if not microservices or you could also call them applications. Uh one has the back end for our consumer facing app, uh one for catalog management and one for everything to do with order fulfillment. That is order tracking, support, etc. um and this was simple and good enough to start with uh, worked fine for us initially to build quickly and roll out new features um the business was also simple enough that's um, you know it hadn't really become very complex everything was on aws from day one uh, and as the business grew as we solved more problems and especially as more people joined our tech team uh, it naturally became hard to work across these applications there were a lot of problems being worked on in parallel a lot of business problems being worked on in parallel um so more people working on the same code bases at the same time usually meant overstepping and involving handshakes at some levels uh more bandwidth seemed like the biggest bottleneck so we acquired another company to double up our engineering strength um the timing was also such that we needed to move really fast as a startup uh we just couldn't take a pause and reflect on how we are going to collaborate on these code bases that were becoming more complex uh every day so we couldn't build the tooling the practices and the developer experience that would allow all teams to move fast with the setup and while the companies that have managed to successfully work with monolithic code bases with far more developers than than profers i think we were a young team not very mature to really understand what we were dealing with especially with the growth pressure that we had uh, being able to divide and parallelize seem simpler than being able to figure out how to make monoliths monoliths work for us so adopting microservices architecture seemed like the next best step uh we started breaking our application into microservices to enable teams uh to work on problems independently every time you would see a new problem that could be independently worked by a team in a domain without dealing with the complexity and chaos of our existing code base we'd spin off a new microservice team started um starting new microservices will choose their own stack to attack the problem at hand so that you know we're choosing the best technology for the problem and to make our teams truly autonomous we felt it was important that we give our teams ownership of systems end to end everything every time if someone needs to run an 
tech experiment, if they get blocked on something because they don't have access for it, we're just not moving fast enough. So we've pushed the idea of developer uh, and team autonomy as far as we could, uh, adopted you build it, you run it philosophy, and enabled teams to make their own technical decisions, manage the entire stack, including infrastructure and operations like configuration management, scalability, resilience, and even handling incidents. Uh, the first bottleneck was provisioning infrastructure resources. So we were on AWS, but not really leveraging it as much as we should. Um, requests to launch and configure EC2 instances, set up, setting up databases, et cetera, would come directly uh, to the extremely under-resourced infrastructure team, which was essentially just one person, that was me. And with the product engineering group uh, growing rapidly, it was impossible for us to keep up with incoming requests. So we decided to get out of the way of developers as quickly as possible. We built automated tools that allowed developers to safely create infrastructure resources without intervention from the DevOps teams. And it really opened up possibilities for our teams to quickly try out things in test environments and put them in production. There's a pressure to move fast and a big artificial bottleneck was out of the way now. So DevOps teams were responsible for governance, for providing processes, tools um, for developers to really own the entire application lifecycle end to end. Um, and one big responsibility for the DevOps teams was to coach developers and help them architect for the cloud, right? So for example, we felt the need for configuration management as a practice was there. And it was really important for us as it would help us manage changes better. It would help with CI CD, it would help with enough um, automation for implementing auto scaling properly across services. And to be able to scale config management well, we just decided that we'll coach all developers on how to use Ansible for their applications, for config management, for CI CD and auto scaling. And we got to a stage where pretty much every developer could work with Ansible to an extent that almost every application was managed using Ansible. Um, and this is a great place to be, right? Like the dev DevOps team was not really coming in the way of developers uh, every day. Developers were able to build features, reconfigure their applications according to those new features and just ship them to, to production. And we were quite proud of that we were able to build these kinds of behaviors in the team. And all this worked really well, or at least that's what we believed was happening. In early 2018, uh, we realized that we had an illusion of agility. So teams were working independently on their microservices, deploying multiple times a day, but there were not enough guardrails for quality. So we were creating a lot of waste. We were shipping poor quality products that were frustrating our customers, internal users, and management. Uh, our engineers were burning out as they were busy firefighting uh, more, most of the time than shipping value to customers. Systems had become so complex that tech debt was getting worse. Writing code was a terrible experience for most teams. Um, the developers wanted to leave because it was not fun working on those code bases. We used to think that solving for just autonomy by creating boundaries, saying, you build it, you run it is enough, and our teams will own quality of what they ship. And to an extent they did, this is what happened. Um, our teams did what they felt was right and was within their control and within their boundaries. But they did not have a systemic view of what was happening in the overall environment. And as a leadership team, we did not do enough to provide oversight over our entire architecture. We ended up with serious problems that changed the course of how work happened at Rufus. We had a proliferation of microservices because of too much freedom and absolutely no guardrails. Teams could create new microservices as they see fit, uh, but we were continuously making our systems more complex. Our microservices eventually became hard to develop, test, release, and monitor in production. In many cases, the boundaries between teams were not clear enough, leading to handoffs, slow releases, and complete lack of ownership. Our quality feedback loops became extremely poor. So poor that we were mostly getting to know about bugs from our customers, customer support, and directly from the CEO sometimes. We also ended up with an extremely diverse tech stack. Um, this slide doesn't paint the entire picture because it is not uh, as easy, honestly, to list out everything. Since technical decisions were localized and democratized, we ended up with a pretty diverse tech stack. You name it, we had it. We had several tools that fulfilled the same purpose. It just didn't make sense. Um, this unnecessary diversity stopped us from achieving economies of scale because of lack of standards, common tooling, and most importantly, mastery over anything at all. Every tech stack required a unique way of thinking about continuous delivery uh, and management of, and maintenance of applications, which made our journey a lot more painful. 
And the worst was that it took us a lot of time to figure out what was wrong. When we realized that quality was an issue for us, immediately we created organizational focus to improve quality. The entire organization, uh, entire technology leadership was driving quality as an agenda. Teams were excited about improving quality, writing tests, uh, was largely believed as a debt that we must pay off. It was not just pushed down from the top, but teams really wanted to do it. Uh, and we were using OKRs as, as the, at the time for setting goals. So we would have OKRs like improved test coverage with KRs like 80% in all the services and uh, nothing would get done. Right? Uh, we're like, all right, maybe it's our first attempt. Let's try once again, be more realistic. So take uh, another attempt with more realistic goals um, we reduced the scope of our services. We made almost meaningful progress even after changing our goals. Uh, maybe a couple of teams made some significant progress, but largely we were uh, not really moving forward. Uh, with all the organizational support and alignment, we couldn't make any meaningful progress. And it was quite demotivating for all our teams because they really wanted to improve things, but were not really able to. They were not really seeing the success that they were waiting for. Um, so we felt we took a big goal that was impossible to achieve in the time frame. Um, so we decided to take another quarter with more realistic goals, uh, reduced coverage target, focused only on a few critical services. Uh, but we made one more change. We allowed teams to pick up some of their localized problems. We had a very interesting observation in this experiment. We saw some teams make progress on some fronts. Onboarding new engineers was a problem, so readme's got better. Integration across services and sharing of contracts was getting hard. Uh, so some API docs were written using Swagger. The recurring issues in productions were hard to debug, so we improved our logs and monitoring. But all of this happened in bits and pieces where the teams felt that these were their problems. And also, testing still did not get better. Like We did not really improve our test coverage on, on any fronts. Uh, so for some reason, we were not able to make progress on testing while we were able to improve on other fronts. The next quarter, we were um, it was, we were even able to attack new problems like load testing, improve some architectural issues to support our largest ever online sale where we expected 3x of our regular traffic. We made things happen and the sale was extremely successful. So this was the story, right? I wanted to tell you with as much details as I could share in interest of time. And of course, there's a lot more that I've skipped. But what I really wanted to do is share, share next is uh, some of the lessons we learned uh, in this journey. So the first lesson is that there's no such thing as a best practice that you must follow. Uh, best practices should probably be called recommended practices. Um, we almost never achieved any of the goals where we wanted to fix a practice across all the services. Anything like let's increase coverage to 80% or uh, let's define SLOs with all the services were not achieved. In retrospect, we didn't get anything done because we didn't need to follow all those practices all the time in all the places. The value was just not clear enough or the effort was not worth it. For example, we started managing infrastructure as code many years back, but it was not always necessarily done with everything we did. It was usually the parts that were fast moving, frequently changing or expected to change frequently, too critical for manual errors or had to be democratized. And that was good enough for us, right? Another story was uh, with config management. Right? Before Grofers, I was coming from the world of Puppet. Love Puppet for what it was, declarative config management. Even though Puppet was probably a better technology, when I introduced Puppet at Grofers, our teams really struggled to get started with it quickly. Um, our reality back then pushed us back to look at something that was much simpler to understand for our teams and get adopted quickly and uh, is extensible for most people. And Ansible for us proved out to be a better choice, even though I still hold the belief that Puppet as a configuration management tool was probably better than Ansible in what it does. Um, Lesson two, DevOps practices that have a clear plan for adoption get adopted faster, especially when the plan is attached to outcomes. Case in point, the time when our teams decided to improve with documentation. If you don't have a culture for documentation, you have to be careful about how you introduce it and change the culture. What problems are you trying to solve? When you went from saying, we need to improve our documentation everywhere to we need to improve documentation to help onboard new engineers faster, our teams felt that without minimal documentation, onboarding new engineers is becoming a big problem. It was affected, affecting the teams directly. 
the outcomes and the associated tasks, tasks were clear enough. Every demo should have a readme with a brief description, clear and well-tested set of instructions, the recommended tooling for development, and clearly defined owners. And so it got done without a lot of stress. We made good progress. At the other extreme of this was testing. There are several holes in our plan to get better at testing. Uh, one big reason why we were not able to progress on testing was most engineers on our team didn't know what tests are valuable enough. Unit versus functional testing was a constant debate. Uh, another big challenge for getting better at testing was a complex was a complex problem deeply rooted in the problem of our microservices architecture, which required a completely different strategy for testing. Uh, we figured this out after constantly retrospecting over our many failed attempts to improve testing. I spoke about some of these challenges at another conference called DevOps Enterprise Summit um, last year. Um, uh, hey, well, so Siddharth uh, has a question. Sure. Uh, I'm allowing him to talk. Siddharth, you can ask your question. Hey, Siddharth. Uh, and also EPAM team three. Uh, so I've unmuted both of you. You can uh, Siddharth and EPAM team three. If you have a question, you want to ask Vedic directly. I guess they are AFK. Uh, maybe we can connect again. Sure. Yeah. Uh, or if they come back, I, I can always pause before the yeah. next part. Yeah. All right, so moving on, uh, lesson three. We found ourselves prioritizing instead of blindly following all the practices across all the services. Um, the cost of paying off debt altogether was very high, uh, but whatever felt like comes in the way of delivering value or was a big risk, there was someone on our team pushing for solving it, solving for it hard, and then those problems will get solved. Uh, phrases like critical services became common in our conversations. That meant something, right? Our failure pushed us, our failures pushed us to adopt, uh, to adopting practices in, in critical services instead of all services. And even if we wanted to make changes in all services together, without a clear execution strategy, nothing would ever get done to an acceptable level where you say that all right, we are finally getting value out of this investment. So having some prioritization framework helps convey the urgency and make progress. And progress is important than being perfect. Um, every team and by extension, the services and code bases owned by them could be dealing with different problems and might have different needs. And the solutions for those problems need to be looked at differently as well, or the prioritization of problems to solve can be different. Um, I've often seen teams get stuck in objectives like standardization. And while standardization is a great idea, standards and systems can also come in the way of moving fast. To what level should you standardize should depend on economies of scale. Um, you want to achieve and not the doing things the same way just because that is how it should be. And often there could be uh, something better to do than just driving standards. Right? There could be some other places where you can get value off. So for example, our consumer facing systems had scale related challenges where our supply, whereas our supply chain systems were the challenges of correctness and reliability. Every time we decide an org-wide technology investment that was not a real priority for every team, like adopting SLOs, we will make progress where it is a priority, but other teams might not be able to keep up. And uh, lastly, as engineering leaders, a lot of our job is to control entropy of the entire system. As the organization and teams grow bigger and bigger, we produce a lot more good in systems. The growing of entropy is largely inevitable, but the rate of growth of that entropy is under our control. Um, so entropy will go out of control when everything is easy. It should be easy for us to do the right things, not just anything. Right? So for example, yes, microservices do enable us to choose different technologies for specific, for specific problems, but that does not mean that it is okay to do it all the time without a good enough reason. Unfortunately, reason and logic is hard to scale. So what do you do? I recommend that you make things harder, especially making technology choices, right? So when you're small, you can make things harder by reasoning about everything. Let's say with the head of engineering or the principal engineer or whoever is the senior most person on the team. But when you're growing and becoming a larger team, you cannot be in every conversation. 
So you have to use economic levers to control entropy so that a person or a team uh, decides to introduce more entropy. Um, they understand that it is worth the effort. Uh, it is not easy to introduce more entropy in the system. What could these levers look like? Uh, baseline expectations like consistent contracts, different types of tests, or it could be um, getting reviews like architecture review, but if not with the senior most person, but then with a more democratized review, like adjacent teams of the same division. So reflecting on a journey uh, got us to learn some of the some of uh, uh, reflecting on our journey got us to learn some of the places where we were going wrong, and um, but we had to figure out where do we uh, go from here, right? How do we internalize these learnings and in our execution across our teams? Unfortunately, we couldn't think of an easy way. We so we started wondering, realized that there is a lot for us to learn, and this is the point where we got introduced to the concept of DevOps maturity. Um, mostly by reading a bunch of really nice book that, books that I'm sure this community is already um, aware about. And um, here's the first maturity model that someone in my team shared on a Slack channel. Um, so this is a delivery, continuous delivery maturity model from the book uh, Continuous Delivery by Dave Farley and uh, Jess Humble. In this, we found a way to articulate what we had, we had learned. DevOps practices do not get adopted in day one you move towards a vision and there are intermediate steps. This framework highlights the importance of different aspects of continuous delivery to turn the concept into execution. And each of those rows in an, is an area that is important for practicing CB. And the columns from basic to expert are levels of maturity. So you start from the left and the expectation is that you're moving towards the right on each of the rows, hence maturing your CD practice. Um, an important call out in this framework is the first row, which is culture. Um, so maturing in most engineering practices is not just about maturing how you use tools and technologies, but also your ways of working. Uh, with a framework like this, you can clearly define those intermediate steps and also use them as internal or external benchmarks. And this was a good direction and it made a lot of sense to us, but we couldn't really take this to our teams and expect them to use it just because it was a, it was too high level and not restrictive enough about practices in specific context. Um, B, solutions were missing. And C, it is aspiration, uh, as in following engineering practices can become a goal in itself than delivering value. So the question we were asking was, how do you operationalize a maturity model? How do you make yourself go from, hey, we wish to become an elite team to a plan and a system that pushes you to get better every day? Here's probably one sixth of the maturity model we developed at Profus, um, inspired by many other maturity models and um, incorporating our learnings. Uh, we call this uh, the microservices maturity model. The idea was to look at all the practices we, while building systems uh, instead of just one practice like continuous delivery. From a distance, it seems similar to the one, to the one that we just saw, but there are a few differences here worth noting. Uh, but let's look at uh, what do we have here first. So on the left side, we have uh, something called uh, pillars in the first column. Um, on the second, in the second column from the left, we have uh, something called areas, which are basically areas within pillars. This way, it is not as high level and gets to a little more details on what kind of practices do we uh, want to see. Uh, and then third column uh, from the left and onwards, we have levels of maturity, uh, level one through level four, level four being the most mature state. Uh, so structurally very similar to the previous maturity model that we just saw. The categories are the pillars um, and are sort of macro engineering practices while the areas are more specific practices within these pillars. Right? So the way, uh, so this way it is not as high level as the previous maturity model and adds a little more detail. Um, these are things that you can borrow from other maturity models, like we did from some, some of the maturity models that are already out there. But the key thing to understand here is that what you decide to put in your model has to be important for your business instead of focusing on everything, right? So remember, it's a journey. Progress matters, not perfection. Uh, so depending upon your business, industry, and journey, you can craft your maturity model that focuses on practices that are important for you today and the ones that are sort of like infinite games that you must start playing now, or you should have been playing already. 
So for example, maybe you're an e-commerce business like Rofus, uh, things like ability to release fast, run many experiments in parallel without breaking customer experience. Uh, these are the things that are important. So you create focus on agility, releasability, experimentation, quality, and resilience. Um, that's what we essentially did. Uh, but maybe you're a fintech business. Uh, then things like correctness, transactional guarantees, security and compliance mattered a lot more than experimentation. Um, you're probably okay slowing down a little bit, especially when you're growing, then, uh, then compromise on correctness and uh, things like security. Maybe you're a B2B SaaS business. Then maybe reliability with compliance is more important. Maybe the cost of, uh, or maybe the cost is very important for you. So you can create a systematic focus on that. Moving on, so the third column onwards, we uh, the, the third column onwards, we have levels, just like continuous delivery maturity model. Uh, but the difference there is that uh, we have two sub columns in them. One is called expectation, and the other is called supported progress. I will come to I will come to expect what expectation means later. But for now, let's just uh, read it like uh, we read the previous maturity model. Uh, so, for example, uh, synthetic monitoring on level two says the expectation is that synthetic monitoring is to be used in production with alerting. And the adjacent supported profess column specifies the recommended way to meet that expectation. In this case, we suggest that services must implement a well-defined smoke suite with P1 test cases that can run in all environments and can be done periodically in production using Jenkins. So we don't just set the expectation but also prescribe how can those expectations be met. That's what helps make a maturing model more prescriptive than open-ended. When a team looks at this, they know where they have to go and how can they get there in Grofer's context. One of the key differences in our approach, which comes from our learning, is that maturity models is, our, our maturity model is not aspirational. It's actually risk-driven. So we don't try to make our services and teams more mature just because they should become more mature. It's not like a career growth plan, like you know, we might want to follow as, as professionals to grow in our career. We get better because our business needs us to get better. And this is where we factor in different kinds of risks uh, in our assessment of each of the services or microservices that we're looking at. So the levels in the columns are not the levels that you try to get to. But the levels are pre-decided for every service because that comes from the criticality of the services in our environment. Uh, this change specifically comes from our learning that we found ourselves in talking about critical services often in our conversations before we introduce microservices, uh, a microservices maturity model, right? And um, we're not going to get better because we should get better. We will get better because we need to get better in something. And this is why we call uh, the first sub columns on the previous slide as expectations. A service at a level that is expected to follow certain principles, right? For example, we have an area called service resilience under which at level three, services are expected to have uh, circuit breakers implemented to avoid cascading failures, while a level four service must practice chaos engineering to continuously validate that failures don't lead to cascading failures. The levels are pre-calculated on multiple parameters like frequency of code changes, number of active collaborators, um, if it is in the critical path to serving the customer, et cetera. And we try to mostly calculate the risk automatically and centrally to use a common logic as much as possible and assign a level to every service and then see which services are where in their DevOps journey. Once the levels are assigned, uh, teams can self-assess and set their journey um, to get to the level of expectation as guided by the maturity model. This started to make a lot of sense. It was getting uh, tied really well into a structure where microservices are owned by teams. Um, after teams did a few self-assessments for their services, it started to make uh, become clear to them as to what are, what are the areas they need to focus on depending upon the nature of the services. Right after, uh, we had the first quarter where most teams organically arrived at the most relevant goals that match their reality with minimal handholding. 
And again, just prescribing is not enough. Teams today have to deal with so many decisions, so many different kinds of tools and technologies. Um, expecting everyone to make the best decisions for everything they, they do is unjustified. Um, this is where platform thinking comes in, uh, clearly defining how we can help teams to adopt uh, various DevOps practices without spending a lot of time uh, making decisions and um, reduce the cost of transformation by achieving economies of scale. So all the things that you see highlighted in red and yellow are the uh, are in the support uh, at Rufus column. Um, these are possible solutions that the platform teams came up with, which uh, that could potentially help the teams adopt practices easily. But these solutions are not productionized today. Uh, so this is this way platform teams also got a clear roadmap of things that they needed to build. And of course, we made sure that uh, we're not tied to the solution. So this, this is more like an outcome roadmap for platform teams than exactly these are the things that need to be built um, when they get to execution of each of these uh, problems that they had to solve. Uh, the solutions could differ a little bit. Uh, this is just like uh, the best understanding of the solution according to the information that is available to us today. Um, it also stopped a lot of debate of uh, we should do this or we should do that. Uh, we now had a framework to accept or reject ideas and focus on platform execution. Um, and I feel that is extremely important for platform teams, especially because the impact of their work is usually not clearly visible, uh, sometimes even to themselves. And uh, an outcomes driven framework like this can help, help keep the platform teams aligned with product engineering teams and the business. Um, the idea of maturity models um, has been debated before uh, about their utility and effectiveness. So the doubt naturally arises uh, is that um, do maturity models really work? Um, in 2017, Dr. Nicole Forstren, who is the author of Accelerate, in one of her talks said that maturity models don't work because they go out of date too fast um, and uh, due to quickly changing technology landscape in an, in an enterprise. Um, and while I don't disagree with the point of technology moving too fast these days, um, doesn't everything that we do today gets outdated very quickly, right? Um, isn't that true with technologies with or without a maturity model, ways of working, organization policies? Are maturity models effective in the way we deployed them at Trufus? I, th I think only time will tell, uh, but we committed to doing this and also committed to revising uh, the maturity model itself with time. Um, and because platform teams derive their goals out of this model, the relevance of everything on the model uh, says has been uh, that the model says has been reviewed and questioned several times after we released the first version. Right. So, for example, uh, it was not that this maturity model was built in isolation. It was first built by a small group of uh, leaders in the technology organization with some platform engineers and senior engineers. And then it was socialized and reviewed multiple times with, with people rep representing different teams, um, especially engineers who are building things hands-on because they're in, in front of the challenges every day. And it was very important to incorporate their perspectives and also share with them our perspectives on how we see that the technology landscape needs to evolve and how this might help. Um, and this really helped us get adoption really quickly because we practically practically covered every team before we announced that this is some this is a framework that we are going to run an experiment. Uh, what we also noticed is that practices that have stood the test of time don't really change. Um, the technology supporting the practice could change, and that's fine because we deal with that kind of changes anyway. Um, approaching a maturity model with a solution to help us scale engineering management with a team that was young and lagged experience, uh, but was highly motivated to be better. And your reasons could be different. You, you'd have to look at your reasons and approach uh, deploying a maturity model, building one and then deploying it according to what your reasons are. So yeah, that's it folks. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session as much as I did presenting it. I would love to take questions or hang out with you after. All right, there are a couple of questions. Uh, first, we have from Siddharth, and uh, Siddharth, I'm unmuting you. Uh, you can uh, ask your question. Yeah. 
so uh, by the could you please share your thoughts on the security to related to devops which is um, presently known as a devsecops where we need to stand for that um hey so that yeah sure i mean I, i don't know where to start and where to end there i think it's a it's a wide it's a really wide topic right um and it i think the answer also sort of like depends on again what is your industry industry and like what, what product are you building um in cases like i said let's say if you're a fintech uh, your your answer to that question would be that you have to drive a lot more control tightly right um but in case of an e-commerce company uh, it might not be it might not require that kind of tight control for us i think and i think irrespective of where you are um my answer to that question is uh, it's going to be slightly abstract in the sense that a business always wants to move fast how fast is again depends on what kind of industry you're in and security in context of devops has to be more about building the right guardrails then coming in the way right uh, you want to unleash your tech team to solve problems right um and this is very similar to how devops and sysadmins used to be before right like or like even if you're on aws if your team is coming to you to like provision a new new ec2 instance or get you a new s3 bucket which costs basically nothing it is an artificial bottleneck the same thing goes with security as well so like can you craft out policies and processes that help your engineers do things in a secure fashion and i think that is the only way that you can scale with cloud because well sooner or later your business is, is going to scale up or let's let's hope that it happens and you'd want to leverage more of cloud and then things will go out of control so devsecops i think for me is the understanding of devsecops is um devsecops is often construed as like or like we put security in ci pipelines that's just one aspect of it i think i think the other aspects of this is that embracing the fact that we are on the cloud so a lot of things are going to be automated or rather should be automated and if they're automated that means that we are going to be doing those things faster and that's fine but let's just make sure that when we are doing something repeatedly over and over again we're reducing risk in that and we are also doing that through automation that will only happen once you embrace cloud if you're moving towards the other trend which is cloud native technologies you embrace that you're in a cloud native landscape you're not going to control every single thing every day you're going to have to let go of control by creating good guardrails right? um i don't know if that answers the question it might be slightly abstract but there's the best that i can answer right now all right yep thanks by the thanks uh, thanks for the so another question is from abhay uh, abhay uh, can you ask a question yeah thanks rujit uh a very really good session so uh, one question i have is with the recent trend where we see a 10 minute delivery happening across e-commerce space uh, is technology has to do something with that or it is more about the business model oh it's all technology uh it's, it's all technology because uh, i guess i guess it's similar right so it's similar to cloud and 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 you know infrastructure management at scale when you have so many servers uh and so many engineers of you know interacting with those servers you cannot have another person come in the way because it just won't scale that's why cloud comes in or that's why virtualization uh and then interaction with infrastructure with apis comes in a lot of what we did at blinkit is actually that uh, of course a lot of things cannot be done using technology uh but it is the business fundamentally unscalable if you're not driving it through tech so for example um and, and this is a very interesting topic for me because supply chains for e-commerce businesses are not not like how you build data centers and in cloud or rather cloud and data centers have been done a lot from physical supply chains is that uh, we were previously in a warehouse like model right and we could control a lot of things there because we could have people on our payroll right? and we would deliver the next day but when you move to a 10 minute delivery model you're not delivering from a warehouse you're delivering from something from a dark store which is much closer to you there's no other way that the delivery is going to happen 
now when we want to deliver to millions and millions of users, we are going to need hundreds and thousands of customers. How many people can you have on your payroll, really? And even if you have people on your payroll, how are you going to control their behavior? Okay. Um, and a lot of that just happens through tech by observing how things are happening, right? Um, and you can apply very similar principles in in scale tech organizations. It's like, all right, I want to, I want my engineers to do the right things, but I can't go and stand on their head, right? So I'm going to build observability in behaviors, um, and that's what sort of like brings you to things like engineering metrics, like the Dora metric. Right? Like you find an, an analogous set of metrics for your business. If your business is ops heavy, not tech business linked. So it's largely tech driven. Uh, a lot of things. For example, it's raining right now. It's pouring here in Gurgaon. Um, most of the tech interventions, when you know such kinds of disruptions happen, are just happening automatically by observing the real time stream of data that is coming from, uh, from the software that you deployed. In, on the ground. Right? Um, for example, it, it might not be written in Bangalore today, so the operations in Bangalore would be fine. But in Gujarat, the system automatically adjusts itself uh, at a locality level uh, to handle such kind of disruption. Yeah, thanks, Vedic, for sharing your experience with us today.